All right, so um, returning to the um, tutorial on time domain thermal reflectance, what I'd like to do now is talk about um, specifically about the pulse laser equipment uh, used to produce the laser beams for time domain thermal reflectance. Um, I suspect that you might want to know some more details about that. Okay, so uh, one of the core components of a time domain thermal reflectance is the pulse laser itself. Um, it is by far the most expensive component in the system and so you want to think carefully about what you want here. Um, so these systems are typically high repetition rate ultra fast lasers based on titanium sapphire oscillators. Um, so this goes by the name of a quote mode locked laser which just means that it's a laser that um, it's taking in green or some, some sort of um, pump light, converting it into a near-infrared laser, and then via a nonlinear process producing mode-locked or pulsed light output, um, typically in the near-infrared region. Um, so uh, the most common way to do this is using some sort of neodymium-based um, uh, pumping laser uh, at 532 um, nanometers and then uh, using a titanium sapphire crystal to convert it um, to a 800 nanometer light approximately. Now, um, most of these things have some level of tunability um, for the near infrared light. So typically you can tune them pretty easily in the um, about the 650 nanometers to possibly up to a thousand nanometer wavelength range. But typically it will have the most amount of light output and the best pulses near 800 nanometers where most people use them. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the companies that make this and some specific models in a couple of slides. Um, now for people who are using these mode lock titanium sapphire oscillators, the pulses are often designed to be the shortest possible pulses allowed um, by the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So you may have heard of the version of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle where um, you can't simultaneously know the position of something and the momentum at the same time. Well, there's a related version of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle that um, covers the, the so-called time energy um, uncertainty principle. So um, it has to do with, you know, basically if you're bunching wave packets together, how well can you know the duration or how, how well can you bunch the, the time duration of a wave packet together and know for certain what energy um, the wave packet's at. And it turns out that there's some um, interplay between those two things. So if I make a wave packet with a duration of 100 femtoseconds, which is typically about um, what these mode lock lasers are doing, that implies a certain energy spectrum to the output lasers as well. Um, so on a spectrometer that shows up as a spread in the wavelengths of the stuff coming out of your titanium sapphire um, laser. So in the following slide I'll show you an example of some spectrum that, come, that I've measured that have come out of some different titanium sapphire lasers. Um, typically you want these lasers to be a high repetition rate. Um, there are vendors who sell so-called non-high repetition rate lasers. Um, so by high repetition rate, what I mean is typically somewhere between a 76 to an 80 megahertz uh, laser. Um, or if you were to convert that into a time between pulses, that's what, a, that's what the high repetition rate means. Um, that would be about 13 nanoseconds in between pulses, give or take a couple of nanoseconds, depending on what system you buy. Um, so it's a very, very short pulse, right? Because if I look at the duration of the pulse, 100, fem 100 femtoseconds, that's 0.1 picoseconds, which is 0 0.00001 nanoseconds. So this is a very, very short pulse compared to the time between pulses. Um, so this is an extraordinarily short pulse um, for what we're trying to do. Um, you might ask yourself, why do I need a high repetition rate laser? What's so special about that frequency between 76 megahertz to 80 megahertz? Well, there's nothing that's special about 80 megahertz, but you do want something in the tens of megahertz. And the reason why has to do, we'll discuss in a lot of detail later, has to do with this electro-optic modulator. Um, the electro-optic modulator is a device that's going to turn on and off the laser at high speed. And the higher speed you can turn that thing on and off, the smaller the penetration depth of uh, heat is going to be for these time domain thermoreflectance experiments. 
typically the whole point of a time domain thermoreflectance system is to be able to confine heat um, to maybe like the top 100 nanometers or so. And in order to get those kind of penetration depths, you need very, very high speed. Um, now the electro-optic modulators typically can only switch at tens of megahertz. And in order for you to be able to turn the laser on and off at those kind of speeds, you need the laser to be coming out a factor of something like four times as fast as the electro-optic modulator is switching. And so if the electro-optic modulator is at tens of megahertz and you need to be four times that fast, that means you need to at least be kind of in this ballpark of, you know, many tens to hundreds of megahertz for the, um, for the repetition rate. And so, you know, for commercial things, the ones that are on the market tend to run around 80 megahertz. Um, so that's why you need a high repetition rate laser. And you'll learn more about that later when we go to talk about the, um, both the analysis of the time domain thermoreflectance and the operation of the electro-optic modulator itself. Um, output powers um, for these lasers, um, you can buy very high power ones, but um, typically they're somewhere around one watt of total power um, coming out of the titanium sapphire laser when it's mode locked. Um, and if you convert that to the amount of energy in each individual pulse, so basically I just have to take the total power and divide it by whatever it is that the um, or multiply by the time between pulses and that'll give you something around the nanojoule um, per pulse mark depending on what the exact instrument you have is so as promised here's some spectra spectrum or some um, you know some spectra that have been measured for the output pulse from ultrafast lasers and uh, on the left side, you'll see an, an example called, a, this is a Mira 900 sold by Coherent, the company Coherent. Um, it's, a, it's a typical femtosecond laser. Um, and if you look at the, um, the so-called full width half maximum, so that's the wavelength range um, that corresponds to the sort of 50% mark of the intensity, um, that's something like 10 nanometer uh, full width half maximum for um, 100 nanometer pulse, and if you're using a shorter set of pulses, like say from a short pulse tsunami, which is on the right hand side, you would find something wider, almost twice as wide for that particular system because it's like a 50 femtosecond laser. And so um, that's that's pretty common observation that you would hope to find in a, in a Heisenberg uncertainty principle limited or so-called transform limited um, pulse. Okay, so uh, there are lots of different lasers that you can use from time for time domain thermoreflectance. The two main companies that are making these things right now um, are Spectrophysics and Coherent. These guys have been competitors for a really long time. Um, for Spectrophysics, they offer two main classes of lasers that would be of interest. Um, the Tsunami is the refers to the titanium sapphire oscillator itself. Um, for spectrophysics and this is basically a box that has a bunch of knobs that you can turn to help you get a, um, a mode lock signal out of your titanium sapphire um, oscillator and um, basically in that system you have to separately provide a 532 nanometer pump laser and then via some tuning of a, uh, a series of slits and mirrors um, you can get it to output pulses at 80 megahertz. Um, Spectrophysics offers a one box version of this that has the 532 nanometer laser built in and has all of those little knobs that you would tune, so like the slits and the mirrors and all that stuff, tuned via motors. Um, and that one box solution is called a Mai Tai. As you can imagine, it's a little bit more expensive. Um, you know, it's probably like a couple of tens of thousands of dollars more expensive. And, um, you know, typically it has, you know, all of the nice things about being fully automated with it and some of the bad things too, meaning that if something breaks, um, it's a little bit harder to fix the Mai Tai than it is, let's say, a Tsunami or a Millennia. Um, so anyway, Coherent offers all the same versions of that stuff. So um, they, have, they offer a manually tuned version of the oscillator called a Mira um, that operates at a slightly lower um, but perfectly okay repetition rate and they have a, a series of pump lasers called the Verdi um, lasers that are basically analogous um, and the combination of a Verdi and a Mira produces um, ultra, ultra fast pulses that are perfectly suitable for time domain thermoreflectance or you can pony up and pay a little bit more for a one box solution called a Vi currently called a Viterra 
Um, and any of these will work just fine. Um, some of them are cheaper, some of them are more expensive. Um, if you're really in, if you really want to be able to tune and have absolute control over um, the specs of your laser, separately buying the pump and the oscillator can be a little bit better, but there's a lot more convenience involved with the one box solutions. Whatever. Um, it really doesn't matter so long as you end up with a high repetition rate near infrared source of light for um, time domain thermoreflectance. Um, so with that I'll talk about some other components of the system.